Cool. So let me give you a little background. I, I was asked to talk about uh, global health and really kind of put a, a specific spin uh, for emergency medicine. Um, I uh, trained, I did my residency uh, back in New York and I finished in 92, which seems longer ago. Longer, yeah. uh, and I've been out here with Kaiser Permanente since then, actually. And um, I, my, I was interested in international, in disaster medicine as a resident and, and doing work internationally. And the first thing I did was as a medical student, I spent two months in, in India. Uh, as, as um, part of my medical school rotations. And that got me very interested in international work, which I didn't really return to for 10 years, just because you're busy building a career and things like that. But um, the other thing I did is that I got involved with our national urban search and rescue system that had just been developing uh, when I moved out here in 92. And um, uh, I went, my first deployment domestically was to the Oklahoma City bombing. And I got very involved with our domestic urban search and rescue system and with domestic disaster response. So that's really my original background. And I still am involved with that. I think the last one I did was the Greensburg uh, tornado in 07, but I'm still in that system. And that gave me a, a really invaluable experience with disaster response, but it was really mostly domestic. I got back to the international stuff uh, when I started doing some teaching in Jordan and, um, and then, <laughs> made connections or links with international relief organizations like Doctors Without Borders and others. And so I've started doing the disaster response since 2002, I guess it was, 2003. Um, so I've done a number of things internationally that way. And because of that background, which was always kind of a side thing uh, in addition to the Kaiser job, and Kaiser said, hey, wait a second, you kind of have developed an expertise around this. Why don't you come do some of that for us? So for the last four or five years, I've been doing two things. One is emergency management for the healthcare system for Kaiser. And then the other one is to promote and support physician community service and volunteerism. Uh, and in that role, that's everything from the local stuff and working at a free clinic on a weekend all the way to the bigger projects like a domestic response to Katrina, for example, or doing international work. So under that umbrella, I've developed a, what, a global health program and uh, the idea with that is, despite my particular interest in disaster response, there are many people who either don't have the skill set or don't have the ability because of schedule and family commitments and work and things like that to do the disaster response. And what they'd be more interested in doing is probably more like the kinds of volunteer things that you've done, which is pre-planned, you know, next summer I can block out a month, I want to go somewhere that's relatively safe and take my kids. or whatever it is, but something where it's, it's scheduled more in advance. And also some people have more of an interest in not just a um, sort of put out the fire of, an, of a disaster response, but also doing kind of a capacity building program where they go and teach or leave some kind of legacy with the work they're doing so it can sort of continue. So I, those are kind of two different things. And so in developing those, I've gone around to a number of other things and in a num number of other places and made established relationships with foundations, clinic systems, other international academic institutions, and, uh, and made affiliations that have allowed us to, to send volunteers to those places. So I'll talk about that a little bit towards the end. So that's kind of my background, and that's from where I'm coming when I, when I speak. So uh, just so you have a, a sense. And so my idea for this presentation was really to separate out the disaster response portion uh, because as an emergency physician, you may have a particular interest in that. I think most of the emergency physicians that I talk to um, who think about doing international response talk about that. And then the other portion in the bottom, I'll talk about the non-disaster response stuff and also as it applies. And the way I wanted to do this was sort of just to present you case histories to see what kinds of things, you know, what are, what's the variation of disaster response, what are the kinds of things you can get into and what's possible. So I want to give you some case histories uh, of my experience. And the first one, I'll, I'll go over three of them. The first one I want to talk about is the, the uh, tsunami that happened in, uh, what was it, 04, 05? Do you guys remember that? I mean, this was, a, this was probably one of the, the global uh, catastrophes that got the most world attention. Uh, and as you can see, the countries in yellow are the ones that were affected. I mean, the tsunami was 
so huge that it really literally traveled thousands of miles and affected the shores in Africa as well as India and Indonesia, so multiple continents um, all over. And this response really got tremendous, um, tremendous global attention, both in terms of money and people going to help. So it was uh, around Christmas time in 2004, it was a large earthquake. On the shores of the countries that were affected, over 230,000 people died and uh, significantly a million were displaced and 14 countries were affected, so it's quite huge. Um, we ended up mounting a response to Sri Lanka, which is this guy over here. So you can see it's very relatively close, and so the wave came in from, from the east, sort of this teardrop-shaped country. And the capital, Colombo, is here on the west. And this area was affected because it sort of got the backsplash. You know, the wave went past and came back. So even this area was affected. But most of the affected people were kind of in this area. And um, so we went from Colombo, where you land, drove across the country, and then spent about a month doing some work here. Um, fortunately, because the international response was so good, over $7 billion were committed to this globally, to all the affected countries, not just Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka alone, there was 30,000 fatalities and over half a million were displaced. But if you know the background history in Sri Lanka, there's been a, a chronic civil war between the, or there was, between the Tamil Tigers and, and the government. Um, do you know the Tamil Tigers actually invented the suicide bomber? Was it Muslim? And this, was a, this is a picture, I just want to give you a sense of, because this is an unusual disaster. I took this flying out of the country, but um, it's an unusual disaster because all that was affected was the coastline. You know, if a big earthquake, the whole infrastructure is gone, roads are gone, communication, that kind of thing, buildings, roads. Here, everything inland was fine, but you can kind of see that because the salt water ended up killing all the vegetation. And so really 100 to 200 yards inland, is really what was affected. And, um, you know, there's no reinforced construction here, so a big enough wave comes by and it topples all of these brick buildings and stucco buildings. And so you can see the ocean here, and anything within proximity of this ocean in all of those 14 countries was, was severely affected. This is the coastal road that runs north south there along that eastern shore of Sri Lanka. And you can see washed out in many levels and became impassable, which created logistically a nightmare because to go up and down, you had to drive significantly inland to an unaffected road and then north or south. So significant logistical delays. And so what ended up happening is people got displaced from their homes because many of these areas are fishing. People live off the water, right? They're, they're fishing community, communities. And, and villages, and so many of these people got displaced from their homes, and they end up in makeshift camps. And this is kind of a, a typical scenario of where a family may end up, a family or two, really. And um, this is just looking at the inside. So this is the whole living area for an entire family. And not that they had a lot to begin with, but certainly in a displaced situation, they have even less, there's less sanitation, there's less potable water, that kind of thing. So an overview of the situation when we got there, really, there, were, there actually were a lot of deaths, but there were relatively few injuries. And it's one of those disasters, you know, like when 9-11 happened, all the hospitals got ready in New York City, and they were expecting lots of victims. But in essence, in New York, the people that were in those buildings just died. There really weren't that many injuries. Same thing here. The tsunami wave comes in, washes people out, they drown, they disappear. And then, yeah, maybe a couple people broke arms or legs running away from the wave, but for the most part, the people that survived were not that injured. So there weren't really too many injured. But there were a lot of displaced. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the term IDP, that's internally displaced people or persons. We distinguish that from refugees. So a refugee is someone who's displaced but crosses a, a country border. And um, refugees tend to do better just from a public health perspective because usually once you cross a country border and you take, seek shelter in another country, a lot of international law uh, comes in to protect you and then usually there's more of a response from the international community to support refugees, whereas internally displaced people are displaced within their own country and frequently they're still in a hostile country and relief organizations have less access to them, and, uh, and there's less laws around protecting IDPs, but we'll talk about that. 
so pretty much intact infrastructure, except for those first uh, 100 yards or so from the ocean shore. There was temporary calming of civil unrest, and I've seen this in a number of places, too, where there's existing civil unrest in the society and a disaster comes, everyone sort of pulls together for a while. And that was one of the concerns, because security becomes a big issue when you do any kind of relief work. Um, and um, the, in this case, the civil unrest had really sort of calmed down, everyone banded together for a while. And, um, and that's one of the things that ended up stopping our program three months into it, is that the, the civil unrest started to flare up and there were some bombings and killings again. Huge international response. And we ended up mounting, at the time, we didn't have uh, any kind of affiliation or association with any relief organization. So we had 300 people just volunteer to go and do something. And our, our leadership within Kaiser Permanente made a decision to send a team. And they asked me to, to lead that team. And I went with two Sri Lankan physicians to start a, the program. And um, so I sort of had the emergency response background. And the other two physicians, one of whom was a gynecologist and the other one was a rheumatologist, not someone that you'd necessarily put. But I can't tell you how invaluable. I totally learned how invaluable it is to have somebody who has the, the cultural context, the language skills, the connections. Because both of them not only had contacts in country, but they, they spoke the language. And, and all of that just opened doors for us in a way that, it, that other relief organizations didn't have those connections. So we, we kind of showed up um, uh, to these meetings that I knew, I knew where to go and talk to the UN and what other relief organizations are here. And I said, you know, we're a group of physicians. We don't have any supplies. How can we help? And they ended up throwing us in with a bunch of other um, NGOs. NGO is a non-government organization. That's kind of the, the acronym for relief organizations that aren't uh, government related. And this actually, in this particular disaster, worked very well and was coordinated very well. And you don't see that in many disasters. Haiti's an example, and I think I'll talk about that as well. But this was the, the map, uh, the makeshift map that we had going. And all these little uh, stickies are where the different camps were. And so we had a, a running list of these camps and how many people they had. And between all these organizations, we ended up splitting up these camps and taking certain ones of them. So sometimes what you run into in these chaotic situations is multiple organizations crossing paths, duplicating work, going to the same place. In this case, it was all coordinated fairly well. And we said, listen, why don't you guys take these areas, we'll take this area. We went and delivered care and we reported back. And there was, there was good coordination for, for data, data gathering and things like that. Fernando, how, how did you impose that order? Um, you know. So I'll talk about this a little bit later, but usually what happens is uh, in a disaster response, and this is true really domestically as well, the locals are the first ones to respond, right? The mayor of the city, the, the council people, whether you're in the United States or whether you're in Sri Lanka. So they're the ones who sort of get out, the people who have some association with civic society, the firefighters, whatever. You go out and you coordinate. If, if the event is too big, then you go up the chain. You go to the county, you go to the state, you, know, you go to the province head or whatever and say, we need more help, and on along the way. So usually there is some local governmental or civil response that is supposed to coordinate this. And then what happens is you'll also then get from the international community, um, you get the United Nations essentially. And if it's a public health or medical kind of event that's involved, the World Health Organization also gets involved. And they help coordinate the international response. So there's coordination between the local government and the, and the, and the country government and these large international relief organizations like the UN. And then all the small players come in as well. So the medical relief organizations come in. And the way the UN does it is they use this cluster system. So they have, um, they have uh, water and sanitation is one cluster. And then they have logistics is another cluster. And then medical is another cluster and all of that. So any of these little organizations 
go to those coordinating meetings, they register with the UN, they register with the local governments, they say, you know, this is who we are, this is what we do, yes, we have controlled substances, let me talk to your Ministry of Health to get permission to use those in country, you know, all those kind of hoops that you have to jump through. And then you get to the site, and then you go to the coordinating meeting with the UN, and they say, okay, you're a medical team, this is when the health cluster meeting is, go to the health cluster. And it's at the health cluster that they say, okay, what are you doing? Well, you cover that area, what are you doing? You cover that area. And that's how it should work effectively, and it actually worked pretty well here. In some countries, there's tremendous chaos, or there's less communication, or there's more infighting, or organizations don't play nice together. Um, so there can be some more conflict. But ideally, that's how it's supposed to work, and it worked well here. So we found those, those people, we registered, we, we went to these meetings, and, and that's, that the day we got there was the day that they said, okay, this has been very chaotic, how can we organize this better? And that's sitting there in the room, we decided let's divvy things up this way. And that's how that got started. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's your question. So the other thing was, as I mentioned, we were, we were just people showing up without, without resources or anything like that. So fortunately, the other aspect of this is that th it turned out that this was the pharmacy that we had to draw from, and this was put together by the local province. So these are all local medications and things like that. And so we were able to kind of come up with a list of what we needed to be able to deliver basic you know, medical care and wound care and things like that. And we got those supplies from here. So in this particular case, we went with nothing and then got supplies from them. But, but that's the other thing is if you're going to strategically do that, you have to have some plan to, to supply yourself. And usually you can do it locally, depends. So, um, you know, I think many times when people think about disaster response, they think, oh, I'm going to go start saving lives and taking care of the people who are injured and taking those who lost limbs, taking care of those who lost limbs or have wound infections or that kind of thing. Yes, you do some of that, even like in an earthquake setting like Haiti, but, but really many times there are other things that are more significant in terms of um, making a contribution to the health of that community. Uh, and really, when you have displaced people, refugees or IDPs, it's not just about the wound care, the trauma care, if they're civil unrest situation, or if they're in an earthquake in Haiti. Um, when people get displaced, you saw the tents, right? You saw how minimally they live. There's no sanitation. There's not reliable access to potable water. So this is actually where I got interested in public health. Um, I mean, it was always kind of a passing interest, but I, I realized that as much as we can take care of the dozen or two dozen or 200 broken limbs, that we can probably affect the health of more people if we focus on really simple and preventive things initially. And that even in disasters, it's quite important to consider water and sanitation, nutrition, the care of you know, pregnant mothers or children under five, all the vulnerable populations, that those things become very critical even in the emergency phase of a response. Um, Measles immunization, for example, which is the only immunization that's indicated in emergency settings. Um, shelter and planning, you see their health care in emergency phase. C control of communicable diseases, you know, I mean, diarrheal illness and respiratory illness are sort of the bread and butter of medical problems that happen in these environments. So it's not high tech, it's not ALS, it's not terribly sexy, it's just making sure someone has clean water, enough living space, and is doing good sanitation. So this was one of our visits to one of those camps where people were staying, and this is my rheumatologist, who I mentioned was invaluable <laughs> because of the language skills and everything. And we had run across a Dutch nurse who was volunteering there and had spent a year there already. So she actually knew the language fairly well, knew the area, and you know, like any good person from an industrial country, and I mean, she was just top-notch pediatric ICU nurse. So we said, come work with us. And, and she was fabulous. So she ended up sort of joining our team and leaving her work for a couple of weeks. And so we set up uh, in school, in schools or anywhere we can get a little shelter or a building, we'd go into a community and use something nearby. And then we would deliver care and we would take our pharmaceuticals and we had other, other uh, wound care supplies and things like that. And people would just line up and, and we would see usually several hundred people a day. This was uh, another clinic. And, but translators are very important. In, in many places, 
even when the people with education um, speak some English, like in Kenya, for example, there's so many tribal languages that English, is, as well as Swahili, is one of their national languages. So anyone with a, with a grade school education can speak English, all the doctors, that kind of thing. But when you get down to the population who have less education, many of them don't speak English, and certainly that's the case in Sri Lanka. And then this is Christine in the middle. One of the things we discovered is, yes, we were delivering medical care, but as I mentioned, those public health messages we thought were very important. And so when we would enter a community, we would speak with the community leaders and do an assessment. How many people here? Do you have anyone who's sick? Do you have any injuries? How many children under five? How many pregnant women do you have? What's your source of water? Do you, are you getting deliveries of enough foods? and we set up and treat people, but then we would also tell them early on, could you gather all the mothers, all the women in the camp, right? Because the women run everything, right? They run the households, they make the meals and everything. And by the end of our doing the clinic, all the mothers would have been gathered and Christine would deliver really kind of a public health message and talk about food preparation and sanitation and, and preventing disease and communicable disease and that kind of thing. And I think this is probably the most effective part of what we did. So in summary for this response, it was an independent response, a small team of physicians. After I left, after a month, someone at home had been um, um, sort of vetting all these volunteers and looking at skill sets and backgrounds, and every two to three weeks we sent a cadre of anywhere from five to ten physicians. And we had 40 to 50 physicians over the course of three to four months that ended up working there. And as things transitioned and things got more stable in the camps and they started building more permanent housing for people, our volunteers ended up going to work in local hospitals where things were kind of overwhelmed and busy as well. And so our volunteers over three to four months made different kinds of contributions to the healthcare that was going on at the time. Um, and that's why I say in the recovery phase that we got involved with the local healthcare system to some extent. Uh, and one of the things we learned, even though this went, I think, extremely well, we realized that we actually put ourselves a little bit at risk to kind of go out there in a lark and, and just go by ourselves and, and not really have an established logistical expert or something like that to kind of help us through this. So even after this experience, we said, you know, if we do this again, we really should partner with an organization that knows what they're doing and does this all the time. And that's really what we've done with Relief International and with Doctors Without Borders, where we can provide the human resources, but we rely on, a, on an organization that does response professionally to provide the logistical support and, and other stuff. Okay, so let me give you the second case history. So this one is post-election violence uh, in Kenya in 2007, and that this is very different from a natural disaster. Right? This is civil unrest and ongoing violence, because I've this was the first response I made where there was actually, the, the crisis was ongoing. That even at 9-11 or Oklahoma City or Katrina, you're in after the disaster has sort of come and gone, um, and, and then you're just trying to kind of dig out and fix things. Whereas this, you'd go to bed and not know when you were gonna be called out of bed to deal with something that had just happened. So it had a particularly disturbing quality uh, to it because it was ongoing. Um, but there was intertribal violence that essentially the, the ruling president didn't want to leave office and he was down 30 points one day and the next day all of a sudden he was winning the elections, one of those things, you know. Um, so over 250,000 people were displaced within Kenya, over 1,000 were killed. And the violence was not only civilian to civilian, but also police to civilian, because the, the police have always been the strong arm of the government, and so the government would send the police in to quell rioters, and, or not even protesters at this point, really. Um, so we saw things like machete wounds, which were civilian to civilian, but we also saw gunshot wounds, which were police to civilian. And the, the weapon of choice is really an agricultural tool, a machete or a panga, uh, and you get some very significant injuries from that, as you'll, as you'll see. So this was a response I did with Doctors Without Borders. Uh, there were lots of displaced people. There was lots of trauma. I did more trauma care than I had done since residency. And it's much worse than a weekend at UC Davis, trust me. Um, actively on uh, ongoing civil violence, uh, government involvement with the violence. So this is where you start to get into a complex scenario where the government isn't necessarily your help, your aid here, right? I mean, they're permissive, they let you work, but if the government is quelling a rioting crowd, they're not gonna help you get access or anything else. So 
politically it becomes a little dicier. Uh, intact healthcare infrastructure, uh, relatively safe, safety for expats, because at this point it was really the civilian to civilian. I mean, they would ask you, what tribe are you from, or what's your name, because they can tell by names what tribal affiliation someone has. So if a white guy's coming down the road, like me, he's clearly not, you know, not the bad guy. So um, that was uh, relatively beneficial. Um, so there was an intact healthcare system, but what happened is the ambulance system basically failed because the riders didn't didn't um, respect those healthcare providers. They didn't care if you were from the wrong tribe. They grab people out of ambulances and torched ambulances and beat up the ambulance driver. So the ambulance driver stopped responding to to calls for injuries and wounded people. So we ended up having to do that. Um, and then limit international response because it was sort of seen as something internal. This is uh, we were out in this is through the windshield, so we were sort of protected. But you see government officials and military, and there are a bunch of protesters here. And what happened is like they would call a protest somewhere, in you know the central square or something like that. And instead of beating the protesters back at the site where the media was, that kind of thing, most of these protesters came from the slums. So the police would wait on the borders of the slums and not even let the protesters out the day that the protest was supposed to happen. And so this was one scene because we knew that there were people going to be coming out. So we went and the guy who's on the ground here had walked down this road with his hands up in the air showing, you know, total, I'm unarmed, I'm walking here peacefully. And as soon as he got within reach, they just started beating him. And they started taking the batons to his shins and his knees and his ankles. And we ended up seeing him as a patient later. Um, and we didn't stay around here very long because I'm sure they wouldn't have liked us there. And my car mates didn't like me taking pictures either. Uh, so this was the, the MSF truck that we had used, again, labeled and, and generally left alone to work because uh, of, we're with a humanitarian organization. And we, as I mentioned, sort of became not just a medical care facility, but also the, the 911 system for these slums. We had a number of community health workers who were connected to the community. And so they would get the calls and say, there's an injured person here. And they would tell us, and we'd go out there and get them. Um, so of all sorts. So this was one of the trucks that we used as a transport vehicle or an ambulance. We ended up beefing these up a little bit and putting more medical equipment in them eventually. Um, this guy was attacked at night, has some broken, nearly amputated fingers. He has a wound up here. Yeah, far more graphic. This guy had been burned. Some very significant injuries. So this is a little hard to see, but we ended up getting kind of this warehouse space in a church compound that had a wall with, with barbed wire around it. So there was some element of, of protection and safety uh, where we ended up setting up. And this facility was near the edge of the, of the slum. Um, and so we had to essentially put everything in there because it was just an empty building. There's no oxygen. There was no light over each bed. We had to put it all together, essentially. And then this is, you know, the slums in Nairobi are infamous for their squalor and everything else. And, and I was really shocked by a couple of things. I mean, I'd seen pictures of them, but most of the people who live in these neighborhoods actually have day jobs. They're the bank tellers and the security guards of the, of the community. So they actually get paid and they, you know, they, for their rent or their meals, they, they pay with the money they earn that day. But 60, 70% of the people who live here actually are employed and have jobs. You see people coming out of the, these houses, going to the edge of the road and catching a bus, and they're wearing a pressed white shirt and a tie because they're going to go be a bank teller somewhere. So most are employed. And two, the other thing that shocked me is people pay rent for these structures, actually. You can see the basic sanitation. So a response for this, uh, their summary was a, a trauma clinic for Doctors Without Borders. I worked there for a month, and I was replaced by another physician uh, from Kaiser. It was integrated with the existing uh, MSF program. MSF actually had an HIV program there that was staffed by internist pediatricians. I mean, they were doing um, HIV TB care, so they weren't uh, experienced at all with trauma. And, but we were able to use the local community contacts and the, 
the, the uh, referral system and everything that they'd already built up through that program, they, we just brought in sort of the, the surgical, the trauma expertise. Uh, we function as a 911 responder. We integrate it into the existing healthcare system. So for those things that we couldn't take care of, uh, for example, if someone needed an x-ray, we'd take them to a local clinic that had x-ray capability and doctors at borders would pay for that x-ray. And then you know, we would set it ourselves or if it needed an operation, in a couple of instances we actually paid for those operations to be done. Some significant head injuries we sent to Kenyatta, which is the big regional trauma center there in Nairobi and that kind of thing. Okay, and the, the third case history I want to talk about is this Haiti earthquake. This earthquake happened in January of 2010. This, the Dominican Republic is this darker gray or an over, and then Haiti is here. And it's really an amazing country. I mean, I think it's just as tragic as many of the African countries. I, I, when, I, when I give people relative numbers, like I'll, I'll tell you, Kenya is a country of 39 million people. They have 37 orthopedic surgeons in the entire country and 34 of them are probably in Nairobi. Right? You pre we probably have 37 orthopedists at our Kaiser or here at UC Davis, right? Um, whereas in Central America, the numbers tend to be much better than that. Um, when you look at how many doctors per 10,000 people, how much does the government spend per capita on, on, on health care, those kinds of things, it's, I always think of it as there's almost a 10 to 1 ratio between what Central and South America does versus what Africa does. And Haiti's numbers and statistics are very much like Africa, basically. They're, they're um, woefully inadequate. Uh, the amount that the government spends on health care is not uh, sustainable and not adequate to deliver effective basic health care services to Haitians. I mean, the situation in Haiti before, uh, before the earthquake was, was, from the public health perspective, terrible already. They paid their... their government doctors that are most of the physicians who, who take care of anyone except the rich in the, in the main city, they pay their, gover their government doctors and nurses every third month. I mean, it's really not sustainable. Um, and you can see so much when you're flying over that Dominican Republic is lush and tropical and forested, and Haiti, just because of land management practices and things like that, has been totally stripped of forests. I mean, it's a barren country. For when so the earthquake happened on January 12th, um, over 300,000 dead, over 300,000 injured. So this is a situation where you have many more injured people and over a million displaced. And significantly, 11 of the 14 ministries were destroyed. This is the Ministry of Finance. As you can see, this happened just as people were getting at the end of their workday. So many of the government officials, including in the health ministry, were killed. All three medical schools were destroyed. Uh, and also significantly, the United Nations building collapsed, and this was the single largest loss of life that the UN has experienced in its history anywhere. I think they had over 60 UN employees die when that earthquake hit. And that's very significant because, as, as I mentioned, in terms of coordinating the response, usually the local UN office um, is the one who initiates the, the coordination of the international work. And in this case, the UN staff and country was so affected, they were essentially paralyzed. So it took at least a good week or two to get enough reinforcements from other UN sites into the country and get set up and going. So it really added to the, to the chaos in those first couple of weeks. The construction here, I mean, there's really no earthquake proofing or reinforcement at all. The, the quality of the concrete is terrible. The amount of rebar that's in there is not to our building standard, for example. So these things very easily fall down like matchsticks. And then, so this is an example of one of the makeshift camps that gets set up. You can kind of see the ocean in the background here. But, um, and, you know, the international um, humanitarian response community has, over time, matured. And there are standards, there's something called the SPHERE standards. Uh, multinational and multi-organizational effort to define the minimum standard of humanitarian response. So there's a water and sanitation area, there's a shelter area, there's a medical area. So for example, the shelter area specifies how many square feet should you have for a person in a tent, of, uh, you know, in a living space. How many square feet of common space do you need for the population in that camp? Where do you set up your latrines versus your cooking? areas. So all those things are kind of spelled out in these minimum standards. This violates that, as most of these places do, because people are too packed in. This is in a soccer stadium. I'm up in the bleachers that you can see the chain link fencing. And again, they're packed in like sardines, really. 
And it's hard to control this because people kind of set this up themselves. And so if you see camps that are done by the military or by the government and order in an orderly way and people are moved in, they look more orderly and you know, everything's laid out in the grid and it's all nice, but usually most people end up in situations like this. So an overview of this situation, we really had large numbers of dead, injured, and displaced people. Uh, social and governmental infrastructure collapse. Healthcare system was totally disrupted and was, was pretty terrible to begin with. Uh, the, the lead uh, organization, United Nations, was significantly compromised. And we mounted a response with Relief International. Um, the airport was closed because the control tower was damaged, and after a couple of near misses, they asked the U.S. military to take over operations of the, of the air traffic control. And so what they did to try and prevent any kind of collision or accident is they essentially let one plane in. There was one runway. They let one plane in every 15 or 20 minutes. And when you need tons and tons of relief supplies and people coming in, it was totally inadequate. So it was a chokehold to get into the country. So we had to go into the Dominican Republic, essentially, and we hitchhiked on this US Coast Guard plane from Florida that was going to bring supplies from the DR to Haiti. And then we got there uh, really within 36, 48 hours. And uh, this, it's hard to see. I think I showed you a daytime picture. But this is an airplane hangar at the airport that had been set up as a makeshift hospital. And uh, at the time, the, the UN was not open, and, and you know, it was middle of the night, so we ended up getting to work. I ended up getting to work uh, just overnight at this place. And again, just like with the urban search and rescue system, up front, there's a tremendous push to save lives, right? Because you have that golden hour, which in international response doesn't exist so much because you can't get there that quickly, but you have more like the golden day or golden three days where you can um, treat uh, injuries and try and save lives acutely. So you just work around the clock. This was, a, we had a couple of US urban search and rescue teams. And other than when we sent our urban search and rescue teams, which are supposed to just be domestic, we sent them to the US embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania. I don't know if you remember that, about 10 years ago. But this is the only other time that they've ever been international. And it took a presidential order to say, OK, we'll send this asset to Haiti for help, but these were Florida urban search and rescue teams. This was a 15-year-old girl that had been trapped in a building. They actually, she was in an unstable situation and they made a decision in the field to do a field amputation to extricate her and they brought her to us afterwards. So that's her left upper arm. And we had set up, I think it's difficult to see. Yeah, so we're outdoors here and this is a table. Um, and we're outside of that airplane hangar that was being used as a medical space or a hospital space. So the, the surgical stuff happened outside under the, under the starlight and moonlight. Uh, this is the next morning and more of a day picture of what you see, that plane hangar. It has these big doors on either side. We strung ropes across to hang IVs and things like that, but we just had these makeshift cots. There were no latrine facilities for patients. Um, the excrement was going along the side of the, the building on one side. There was no food supplies. Um, pa family members had to come in here and help do wound care and things like that because we didn't have enough staff. So that was the first couple of days. But then we, the, the real mission that I was there for was to set up medical services with and for Relief International. And so that next morning, we registered with the UN. We, we got some information. We hired drivers. We were buying. I walked in the country with ten thousand dollars cash too, because there actually there was no immigration. We went to the immigration counter, and there was a big crack in the wall, and there was no one manning the desk. I mean, it was completely lawless. We walked in the country, you know, without any authority. There was no banking system. Knowing that, we took. I took in ten thousand dollars. We were buying gasoline out of. Uh, drums in the street corner kind of thing for, to fuel the cars. And that was the job every morning. And that's why I say the most important person in this kind of thing is not the physician or the medical team. It's the logistical people who make it happen. Because you can't lay hands on a patient or take care of anybody unless you've gotten driver, you've gotten fuel, you've gotten to where you need to go, you've set up the tent, you've got security. All those things have to happen before you even start delivering care. So on day two, um, other personnel came in for our team. Long story short, we ended up finding a place in Carrefour, which is part of Port-au-Prince, which is really near the epicenter. Uh, and we set, up, um, we set up shop. The first two weeks, 85% of what we saw was trauma care related to earthquake injuries. 
After that, it fell off very quickly. And by the third week, we were really seeing 85% the kinds of medical problems that you see in underserved populations in tropical areas. We saw neglected you know, nutritional problems, neglected hypertension and diabetes, skin problems, tropical infections. Josh Weil is a UCD 96 graduate, 97 graduate. Um, so he came down, as did a number of other ex-UCD people. So this guy had a femur fracture, on no pain meds. His sons brought him in. You know, he had an arm around each son, and he just kind of dragged the leg straight in. And never grimaced or winced, and fairly amazing. Um, so there was a bit of chaos for people coming to see us, and we realized we had to get some crowd control going and set up a triage system. We actually had two paramedics with us. And the crowd control came up as simple as running a, a rope down this wall. And people actually very orderly lined up, which gave us a much better sense than this that seemed like, OK, we, can we control this crowd or not? So this became a lot simpler. And then the other thing we did, having emergency nurses and physicians and paramedics who, you know, that, that doorway diagnosis kind of thing, that they went down this, this long thing every morning and picked out the, the 20 sickest looking people and put numbers on them. And that's who we saw first. And then we saw everyone else first come first serve. And those sickest tended to be the infants or the frail, or you know, some people looked like really ill. And so it's pretty easy to sign up, do that eyeball triage. So we didn't have a specific triage system. We weren't vitaling everybody or anything like that. But it, it's a system that worked fairly effectively. We had a couple of tents running. So the summary of this response in the emergency phase, we sent mostly emergency medicine staff. Uh, and as I mentioned, we saw mostly trauma care up front. Uh, then after two or three weeks in the replacement teams, we actually started bringing in pediatricians, OBGYN, family physicians, internists. Some of them worked in the tents, some of them went and worked in local hospitals and backfilled and, and did that stuff. So uh, as soon as we got on the ground, in addition to delivering care, the Relief International folks put in a grant, and they were given a $2 million grant by US Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. And we set up five mobile clinics to continue doing care. So that's what the recovery phase was. And then long term, we're still there working on shelters and water and sanitation. And we sent 40 to 50 physicians and nurses over about four months. So um, rarely are these disasters isolated. As you've heard from these case histories, there's frequently geopolitical issues involved, social and ethnic issues. Security is a big, big thing. When I responded to the Kashmir earthquake in Pakistan in 05, I wouldn't go to Pakistan now, but 05, it wasn't bad. Um, I couldn't get any other Americans to volunteer. It's just this perception that it's an unsafe place, that you know they're Muslim, they hate Americans. I couldn't have felt safer. And when people ask me in Pakistan, where are you from? I'd say the United States, their jaw hit the ground. And they just said, you're from America, and you're here helping us. And so I felt almost more like an ambassador than I did a physician in that situation. For Haiti, uh, tons of people volunteered. Right? And, um, and I don't, maybe it's closer to home, or it's not perceived to be a, 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 you know, an adversarial Muslim nation or something like that. But Port-au-Prince is far more dangerous than many places in Pakistan were in 2005. More relief workers have been kidnapped or harmed in Haiti than were ever harmed in the Pakistan earthquake in 05. Um, so many of these aren't just isolated disasters. They're also complex humanitarian emergencies. Uh, it's an acute event, but usually against the backdrop of poverty, of lack of resources, environmental degradation, public health infrastructure being very tenuous like it was in Haiti. So these are much more, the international things are much more complex in general. Um, so this slide really was the question that Mike asked that I sort of answered that initially you have the local response. When, when it's big enough, you go up the chain and ask for country response, and then you go international beyond that. Uh, you know, the, the alphabet soup of acronyms, United Nations, World Health Organization, Pan American Health Organization. So, just like we have an EMS or in medicine, that the humanitarian community has the same kind of alphabet soup. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, there's other issues come in around your operations. Do you work within or outside an existing response work? If you have a very inefficient government system, like the Ministry of Health in Haiti, for example, do you just like stop working with them and go do your own thing because you can be more effective? Or do you still find ways to work with them so you can be part of their process as well? 
kind of more complex than this. But a um, couple of things in in working with other organizations, realize 85% of care done by humanitarian relief organizations is done by faith-based groups. Um, so like World Vision is a Christian organization, whatever. And so many of these organizations, you don't know that they have a religious affiliation at all. Some of them, you know, the cross is right there on the front of all their literature. So it really varies too. Uh, and then some of them are, are non-denominational or non-sectarian, of course. Uh, a couple of points about the non-disaster stuff and how it relates to, to emergency medicine. Um, you can sort of break this up to non-disaster short-term interventions, and these are usually those kinds of surgical missions, those ENT surgeons that'll go and do cleft lip and palate type of, of surgical repairs, or the, the ophthalmologist who have their operating room on the plane that they land on and they bring patients to them. It's all sort of very... Uh, circumscribed and very specific mission at hand, and they usually leave the post-op care for a local, for the local healthcare system or something like that. Uh, and that certainly has its role, uh, but it's not going to address all the needs of, of public health or, or healthcare in these developing countries. So the other thing are these long-term capacity building projects that usually involve hiring and employing and training up the local healthcare resource. Um, one of the things that professional healthcare, global health people sort of look down upon is this idea of medical tourism where you do a trip for a couple of weeks and you know you feel good about going but you don't really leave much behind. I mean you go and you, you diagnose hypertension, you give someone a month or two's worth of hypertension, that person's going to run out of that and they're not going to see a doctor again for another year. You know, what good have you done kind of thing. I, I think while that's not going to be the solution to the world's problems around global health or, or underserved health care um, in the world, I think it plays a very significant role in giving us in the healthcare system exposure to these experiences. Right? That, that the people who do this say, hey, that was really valuable and worthwhile and I got a lot out of it, I'm going to do something else next time. Or I'll get involved with one of these organizations in a more long-term way. Or I'll do this off, on and off throughout my career. And as you develop a, a knowledge of how medicine is delivered in these countries, you become more effective at helping teach when you go on these missions and things like that. So I do think there is a role in some ways around that. All right, so what is global health? What does it mean exactly? This is out of the Lancet from 2009. Uh, global health emphasizes transitional health issues, determining solutions, involves many disciplines, synthesis of population-based prevention and individual level clinic care, perhaps something a little simpler, kind of things that would make sense. So as, as we have coined the term, we've gone from international health to global health. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, in addition to the disaster response, I realized that there are people who have an interest in doing non-disaster work and in developing affiliations with other programs. This is where we've been working. Uh, we have programs in Kenya, Zambia, now Cambodia, Vietnam. Uh, we have an organization that goes to India. I was just in Burma a couple months ago setting something up there. We're going to put something together in Peru, and then we have a couple of organizations that have worked in Central America. One of them is, uh, I'll just mention two of them, this Maribabu is the Swahili word for treatment. This is the first program that we affiliated with. It's in Western Kenya. Uh, we've had actually well over, I think, 150 clinicians at this point. They've built their first hospital, and we've, we've had a lot of residents go as well. Kaiser Permanente actually has 400 residents, mostly in Santa Clara, Oakland, and San Francisco facilities, and the global health program that that I've been developing, we've made open to the residents. And we actually have funding support to pay the expenses for our residents, which is unique in global health. Um, I've, uh, we're part of a, uh, global health uh, universities, and, um, and the, the biggest issue is funding, funding, funding. And uh, fortunately, we've been able to find some funding through our GME to support residents that go on rotation. Um, and then this is a rural base. So the other thing, in addition to providing these programs, because the idea behind developing the health program is let's get some opportunities in, in, in geographically diverse places, right? Some people would prefer to work in South America. Some people want to visit Africa. Some people would rather go to Asia. But the other thing is I, we wanted to develop 
clinical experiences that were clinically diverse. So Madi Babu is a rural program. You're going to end up doing more kind of rural type care. This one here in Da Nang, in Da Nang General, it serves the, the population of one million in Da Nang, and the catchment area is another million outside of that. And it's the public hospital for all of those people. They have 43 specialties, including CV surgery, neurosurgery. So what's nice about this is specialists can go because if you send a cardiologist or gastroenterologist to Mari Babu in rural Kenya, he's not going to have, they're not going to have an echo machine or, or, or endoscope to do procedures. They have to kind of do more primary care. Whereas at a, universe, at a tertiary care affiliation like we have in Zambia or here, uh, they can practice their specialty. The emergen this is the emergency department. This is their intensive care unit. The intensive care unit, they have 24 ventilators for the whole hospital, and every single ventilator is used all the time. You know, in this country, in emergency management, we talk about crisis guidelines for care or standard of care. You know, when, when do we uh, decide that patient A doesn't get the, 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 uh, the ventilator because he has less of a chance to survive, patient B should get it. You know, that kind of decision that may come up in a disaster kind of thing, they live this every day, right? They have to decide who's going to get the ventilator, who has a higher chance of survival. So even in a day-to-day -day basis, the, the, the care decisions are, are fascinating, I think, for us to experience. And this, I think, would be a great place for emergency people, emergency medicine folks to go. I've had this vision of developing a program where we develop a curriculum of 30 core lectures. And uh, you know you can deliver 15 of them in two weeks. So you send in two or three ER docs. You deliver the 15 lectures. You work at the bedside with their emergency folks. You teach them. I mean, they don't frequently even use basic triage principles. But they do wound care incorrectly. So, I mean, even basic things like what you would learn at a first year level, they would benefit greatly from. Um, so doing that, some kind of program is very easy to get involved with. And then. Um, the Global Health Education Consortium, I, I believe the UCD is a member of this. I think that some of the internal medicine folks who are interested in global health have told me that UCD has a membership to this. They've recently merged with this consortium of universities for global health. Uh, I would recommend that if you have any interest in this, you go to these websites. It used to be, I think it still is, if you have an institutional membership to GHAC, um, that you get unlimited resident memberships. So I think if UC Davis, by having an institutional membership, uh, you, and you can go online as a resident and look it up. If your institution is a member, you get a free resident membership. And this has all sorts of valuable resources online, uh, learning modules and things like that around global health. Okay.